Thank you very much. I appreciate that awfully kind introduction. I, uh, I was sitting in the, in, in the green room just a moment ago trying to think, what in the world do I say? Because if you stop and think about it, whether it's with Justin Amash or Thomas Massey or with Paul Brown or Raul Labrador, I mean, you have some real liberty heroes. And what's interesting, going back to those Ron Paul votes, um, it was fairly lonely back then. And what's interesting now is there is a really strong and vibrant liberty movement that is in strong co contrast to where things were when I left 13 years ago. And it is indeed because of Justin Amash, Raul Labrador, uh, Paul Brown, go down that list. And so, you know, given the fact that, you know, I'm sort of the newcomer on the block coming back, um, I thought, what could I add to what they're already saying or about to say? And what hit me were just three thoughts. One, thank you for getting it. You know, when you talk to folks back home, oftentimes, you know, you'll say, well, no, what, what's this about? And they'll say, you know, it's about lower taxes. Talk to somebody else, you know, it, it's about less government. Talk to somebody else, they say, you know, it's about more accountable government. And all those things are good things, things that we're for, but that's not what it's about. And you all get what it's about. Do you remember the closing scene there in the movie Braveheart? Right as William Wallace is about to head toward his maker, he yells out that sacred word, freedom. That's what it's about. And you all get that. And it's so important in the political system to have people get what it's really about. Because when you go back 200 years, you look at a, a band of brothers who came together of their own free will, their own volition. I mean, a bedraggled group, if you really think about it. And they went against the most powerful military force in the world at that time. And they go off and they beat, no, they don't beat, they whip the most powerful military force in the world at that time. And then they go off and they codified this revolutionary thought that all men are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, life and liberty and the pursuit of happiness, but that the big kicker was that the individual was to be the sole repository of power in our political system and that any government, federal, state, local, you name it, had legitimacy only in as much as there was consent by the governed and that, that power in our political system came from God to man and from man was loaned up to government. And yet what's interesting about what the founding fathers said is that that's an incredibly fragile notion. And so they said eternal vigilance was the price of liberty. They said that the normal course of things was for government to gain ground and for liberty to yield, which makes what you all are doing, your engagement in this process so incredibly important. And so I want one to say simply thank you for getting it. Lower taxes, less government, all that good stuff is important, but those are simply means to the end of liberty in a liberty-based system that our founding fathers envisioned. I would say secondly, um, I, uh, I, 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 I want to, I guess, remind you and ask you to really push for candidates with a clear vision. As just in a moment ago, you know, in the green room with Raul Labrador, who'll come out in a few minutes, he has been so articulate when he speaks to the conference, people listen, because he's very clear about the vision of what he's about. And, and I would just ask every one of you that when you talk to candidates back home, that you ask, you really demand that they have that same kind of clarity of vision and that frankly you yourselves think about how clear am I vision because the Bible says where there's no vision the people perish. How clear am I on my vision because until I'm really clear on my vision I can't convey a clear vision. Th think about what Barry Goldwater said. Do you remember his line? He said, um, he said, I have little interest in streamlining government or in making it more efficient, for I mean to reduce its size. I do not undertake to promote welfare, for I propose to extend freedom. 
My aim is not to pass laws, but to repeal them. It's not to inaugurate new programs, but to cancel old ones that do violence to the Constitution or that have outlived their purpose or that impose on the people an unwarranted financial burden. I'll not attempt to discover whether le legislation is needed before I first determine whether it's constitutionally permissible. And if I should later be attacked for neglecting my constituents' interests, I shall reply that I was informed that their main interest is liberty, and in that cause, I'm doing the very best that I can. Wow. Is that a clear vision or what? And uh, I would just ask every one of you to insist with the candidates that you talk to that they have that kind of clarity of vision. Third thing I would say is, do you remember the, um, what was the movie, Jerry Maguire? There's some scene with Tom Cruise and it's something like, show me the money or I don't remember the exact scene, but you know the scene I'm talking about? Well, in politics, it's kind of the same, show me the money. And what I'm getting at by that is, remember how important how much we spend is as a barometer of where we are on freedom. Milton Friedman said that the ultimate measure of government is what it's spent. Now, that's not the only measure, but it's a pretty important one because how much government spends then drives a whole host of other factors. It drives how much you tax, how much uh, big your deficits are, how much you borrow. And oftentimes, people will be, quote, conservative, but they'll leave off the whole fight against government spending, which I think is integral to the liberty movement. And I'll give you two reference points on that. One is... There was a, a, a book written, recent, written recently, and if you've got insomnia, this is just your book. Uh, it'll, it'll take care of you. Uh, it's entitled, This Time It's Different, written by a professor from Harvard, a pre professor from the University of Maryland, Reinhardt and Rogoff. It's entitled, again, This Time It's Different, and it chronicles 800 years of financial history uh, as it relates to government. And what they found was that in every instance, civilizations got to this tipping point wherein they had to decide, do we go back to what made us competitive and perhaps a world power in the first place? Or do we stick with this happy but ultimately unsustainable cycle of upward government spending? Uh, and more often than not, they said, we'll stick with plan B, saying this time it's different. But it never is. Math always works. And so I would just beg of you to remember how important money is in this equation and how important it is to limit that if you want to advance freedom. And the other reference point I'd make on that, that is, remember the number 2025. 2025 is not in our grandkids' time, it's not in our kids' time, it is in our time. And that's the number at which we're only gonna have enough money in the federal government to pay for interest and entitlements and nothing else. Let me say that number again. In 2025, based on Congressional Budget Office numbers, we will only have enough to pay for interest and entitlements and nothing else without significantly more in the way of borrowing, significantly more in the way of deficits, or significantly more in the way of taxes. This train is coming at us and it's coming fast. Fourth point I'd make is simply this. Remember how much power you have in making a difference. And I think that's something oftentimes we forget, whether we're relatively young, uh, well, I'm not young anymore, I'm middle age, whatever I am, but uh, young as members of Congress, or young in the political uh, movement, or young in the world of politics, remember how much of a difference you can make. And there are a thousand and one different stories out there, but it hit me, because I just, a few hours ago, walked through the rotunda had some friends from Georgia visiting, and I was walking them over the Senate side, and did you know that in the history of our republic, only 31 people have laid in state or laid in honor there in our nation's rotunda? It's really sacred ground. And, 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 and it's normally reserved laying in state or laying there in honor is reserved for people who served our government at the highest of, of levels. I mean, you know, a, a, a MacArthur, a, uh, a Reagan, uh, I mean, uh, Eisenhower, I mean, go down the list. I mean, really, I mean, I mean, significant folks on that front, only 11 presidents, or uh, it's reserved for some soldier who died in some far off battlefield fighting for the freedoms that we enjoy as Americans, as unknown soldiers have laid there in state after 
uh, World War I and World War II and the Korean War and the Vietnam War. But did you know that there's an exception? And her name is Rosa Parks. And when she died in 2005, the Senate drew up a resolution to honor in this way, and she was indeed laid there in honor. And what's interesting to me about her story is she's nothing more than a simple seamstress on her way home from work, December 1st, 1955, Cleveland Avenue bus line, Montgomery, Alabama. Driver comes back, asks her to give up her seat, and she says no. And that single act of defiance by an otherwise insignificant human being changed the course of the history of our nation. And so my submission to every one of you as you're part of this conference is to remember what you and I collectively can do in advancing this theme that we believe in called liberty. Thanks again for letting me come by. I appreciate it. Thank you.